Hi, I just uh, believe we've got a little bit of a technical problem. If you can see my screen that says Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology, would you click the raise hand icon? We're a small group, so you can. Okay, interesting. Thank you. So that means you can hear me as well. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Um, we are a tiny group. I hope it grows. If not, though, I am thrilled to do this for whoever shows up because I just love this stuff. I love teaching this stuff, and I'm glad you're with me. My earbuds don't like to stay in very well. Okay, there we go. Hopefully that will work. All right. So just while we're waiting, just another 30 seconds before we start, you can see on your screen all of my different social media links. And I would love it if you would make a note of them, bookmark them, and uh, be with me on them. Go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel so you know when I've released new stuff. And I typically am putting new stuff up every not once or twice a week. Facebook, that's where we can have an iridology conversation. So look me up there. Look me up on Instagram, which is where I'm really active, typically two or three or four posts a week. And look me up on LinkedIn and follow me and like me and comment and let's have a conversation. I would love to have that with you. All right, and let's get going here. We are good to go. So welcome to Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology. We're going to talk about heart and circulation markers today. Before we begin, I want to get to know you a little bit. And like I said, we are a very tiny group tonight. And that's okay because it means we have more interaction, right? I'm okay with that. Big groups are fun. Little groups are fun. They all have their advantages. But I would love it if you would do this little poll for me. I'm going to do a couple of these to get um, going with. Hopefully you can see that. My, my thumbnail is, there we go, yes. Is finally maybe working. What background do you have in holistic health already? And you can check as many of these as apply to you. Do you have um, nutrition and herbs, homeopathy, naturopathy, body work, energy work? Not much yet. I'm just starting out. So again, we are a tiny group. I'm inviting you to play all in with me. Get in the sandbox. Let's build some sandcastles. Let's have some fun. Let's share the toys. Let's play together tonight, okay? Wonderful. Thank you. So you both, uh, we've only got two on the call so far, and I'm not minimizing you, but it, it means that I know if someone hasn't voted. <laughs> I don't know, is that a hot seat for you or not? But you both voted, and we've got nutrition and herbs here. Lovely. Thank you so much for doing that. I really do appreciate that. If you've been with me before, you know that I like to tweak my presentations on the fly. And if I know that we've got more nutritionists than herbalists, I can lean it a bit that way. If I know we've got more herbalists than nutritionists, I'll lean it that way. But since I worded the question the way I did, it's going to be an even balance. But if I've got people who do other things, I can often throw in bits and pieces for them as well. So I'm excited that you are with me. And thank you so much for coming. We're going to be together for about 90 minutes. And um, I recognize some names here. So this is good. This is good. You know, I plan for 90 minutes and I usually need every minute, right? So I hope you're with me for the whole time. And regardless of whether your specialty is nutrition or herbology, I'm glad you're here. What I've seen in my nearly 40 years in the wellness, wellness industry is that the best healers are the ones that keep learning. The best practitioners are the ones that keep learning. And that is so, so important. And because that is so important, I want to do another quick little poll here. And I want to know, there we go. I want to know what training you already have in iridology. Do you have any? Are Jensenian, some other school, constitutional, IPA certified? I would love to know what your background is because, again, if I know I've got a lot of advanced people on on the on the um, webinar, I will up the the ante a little bit. If I know I've got some that are brand new, I'll make sure I keep it basic, but I'll also make sure that those of you who have some experience get what you need. Thank you so much for weighing in on that. So we've got someone who's brand new. Welcome. We've got someone who's had some training from another school. So that's exciting. Thank you so much for being with me. 
All right, so there's challenges you might be facing um, in your holistic health practice. And one of them is that you know a lot. You've studied, uh, even if you're in school, you know more than your clients do, right? So you know a lot. And sometimes because of the way we are trained in school, we are not taught where to find, find that starting point and how to develop a program and where the first end point is going to be. We are taught how to do case studies, how to do everything, figure the whole thing out, but never do we have a beginning or an end. And that is a problem because it means we don't learn how to set therapeutic priorities. We don't know how to pick that starting point. The second problem that many of us have is that we, um, we feel like we don't know enough. So when we have a client come in with a, something that we're maybe not too familiar with, we spend hours doing research just for them. Or sometimes we dress it up and say, well, I wanna give really good value, so I'm gonna spend some time doing research and developing this really nice report for them. But the problem is, unless you're charging megabucks, you're not getting paid for that extra time. And that's a problem because you know you really do need to be paid for the time you invest. And the third problem we have is that because we've been trained in this modality of writing case histories and writing case reports and giving lots and lots of detail, we sometimes forget that our clients don't know everything we know. And because of that, when we give them these massive reports, we do what I call fire hosing. We just turn it on full blast and let them have it. And it means that they get lost. I, I, I'll tell you some stories about that later on, but we overwhelm them. They can't handle it. They, you know, why would they bother coming back? If you've given them 17 pieces of homework and they can't do them all at once, why would they come back? They're gonna be a failure no matter how they look at it. Or um, you give them this big fancy report and they think, great, I've got the two things I need. I don't need the rest of it. Great, I'm good to go now. So those are all things that get in our way. If any of those things sound like you, I want you to click that little raise hand icon. I'm gonna get you really interacting with me tonight if that's okay with you. So if any of those sound familiar, raise your hand. Yeah, thanks for being honest. I appreciate that. Now I wonder if there's maybe some people who are a little shy to interact yet because our group is growing a little bit, so I'm glad you're here. We're going to look at how iridology can help you fix that, fix all of those problems actually in one big, one fell swoop is probably the best way to say it. How do I know that these are your challenges? I've been there myself. Like I said, I've been in this industry for nearly 40 years. And when I started out, there weren't even schools that we could do case histories at. I worked with another herbalist who was also an iridologist for about a year, and that was where I got my hands-on training. But I was not taught how to find a beginning, a middle, and an end. I was just taught how to do a session, which isn't really effective because you don't know where the session is interjected in the sequence of things. So I've been in the situation of not knowing where to start, not knowing where to finish, and because of that, giving my client way more than they should have had in any sitting and they couldn't handle it. I've also interviewed a lot of, of nutritionists and herbalists and other holistic practitioners and almost every one of them has been there too. This is such a common set of problems that it's, it's just not even funny. If this is you, you're not alone. I don't know if there's comfort in numbers with this, but you're not alone and you don't have to stay there. Right, because what we know is that if we scare our clients away by giving them too much information, too much homework, it costs more to find another client than it does to keep a current one happy. Right, so if you want to reduce your marketing expenses and if you want to have a bigger business, let's learn how to keep those clients happy. So who am I? This is me, I'm Judith Cobb. I've been a holistic health coach since 1981. I've now accepted the fact that that means that I am older than most of the people I teach. And that's okay, right? That means I've got some experience under my belt. I've been a master herbalist since 1983, a nutritional consulting practitioner since 94, an NNCP since 2016. I've been an iridologist for a lot of years. Actually, I started doing iridology before I certified for the first time in 93. 
But in 2016, I upped the ante and I became certified with the International Iridology Practitioners Association. I've been teaching wellness professionals since 1985. See, when I started in this, like I said, I apprenticed with another practitioner here in Calgary, and that was all fine and dandy, but I couldn't go far enough with her. I couldn't get enough information enough fast enough, and back then we didn't have the internet. I know it's hard to believe there was a day before the internet, right? And so I would find out about a class through some magazine or through some kind of advert advertising and I would send away for it. This is back when correspondence really meant writing it down correspondence, right? And I would get the course and we would send things back and forth by, by postal, by mail, and do the courses that way. Well, in that first several years of my practice, I amassed a good base of knowledge. And as I did that, many of my, my clients wanted the information too. They wanted to study. They wanted to actually develop their own businesses, and many of them did. So I started teaching them what I knew in 1985, and I've been teaching ever since, and that's a really happy spot for me. I'm a wife of one, a mom of seven, and a grandma of seven. Now, I just recently taught for a major corporation in the United States at one of their herbal conferences. And um, they said, that's really funny to put wife of one on your slide. And I thought, well, I never thought of it that way. I guess it is kind of funny, but the most common question I get from my personal life when I say I've got seven children is, is that all, are they all yours? And is that all one husband? And it's yes and yes. So the wife of one, mom of seven and grandma of seven. So would it work for you today if I could teach you what I've learned through the 40 years of the school of hard knocks, we'll call it, where I learned I spent a ton of money on courses and trainings that didn't take me anywhere useful, less money on courses and trainings that were really helpful. And I want to share some of that with you tonight. Would that be okay? That's okay. Let's have you click that raise hand icon. Yay. Okay. Awesome. Good. We are all in. I love it when everyone plays in the sandbox with me. It makes it so much more fun. All right, so here's what iridology can help you do. And I know, um, I believe the person who's joined us uh, also has some iridology background. So some of you know this, but some of you don't. So here we go. Iridology can help you eliminate your intake forms. I have this big bugaboo. I don't like intake forms. That I get really annoyed when I go to a doctor's office and they want me to fill out this long form. Let me sign a release form. I'm fine with that, that we should all have all of our clients sign a release form, an informed consent form, whatever you want to call it. But when a doctor makes me fill out this whole long questionnaire that I know they're going to look at for about 30 seconds, if that, and then they're not going to look at it again, and I'm going to have to refresh their memory on whatever was important, it just drives me crazy. Why waste my time? So I'm going to show you how to get rid of your intake forms. Your clients will love you for this. I promise. I'm going to start you. How, I'm going to share with you how to start creating deep rapport from the moment you start the consultation, instead of with you looking down at that awful intake form. We create rapport by you know looking at people, right? We need that face to face. That's how we create rapport. Even with someone that's blind, what do they do? They touch your face, right? They want to know your face. That's how we create rapport. Iridology helps us with that because we're looking at the person, right? You know, got my eyes on you kind of thing. Iridology can help you do a core assessment in less than five minutes and it will help you know what are the right questions to ask your client. It will help you to prioritize what needs to be dealt with first and to create that therapeutic priorities list for future future consultations. What I like to do when I'm doing iridology, and I'll talk about this a bit later on as well, is when I've, I've found out what my client wants my help with, and when I've got their eye photos, because I do have a camera and I do look at their eyes on a big computer screen, I will look at their eyes in the light of what they've asked for help with. And that's where I'm going to pick my starting point, right? But I'm going to pick one or two things that I'm going that I see in their eyes that I will teach them about 
tie that into what they asked for help with. And then I'm going to, to teach them where we want to start with supplements and nutrition, just a couple of ideas. And then I'm going to say, and the next time we meet, if you are ready, we are going to go here. So I've planted the seed for what comes next. And now that gives them a reason to really stick with what we're, what I've taught them and to really give their all so that they can move on to the next step. So important. I'm also going to teach you how to eliminate that unpaid homework time we talked about. Because if you are spending two or three hours or four hours, and I know there's a lot of people out there spending four hours of their own time for every one hour of paid time, they are, um, they don't have the income they should have. Now, I'm not a money grabber, but I do have bills to pay. And if I'm charging, oh, let's pull a number out of the air, $100 an hour for that face-to-face -face consultation, but I'm spending four of my own hours with them, I'm now making $20 an hour, which is precious little more than minimum wage, and it's barely a living wage where I am. Now, if I could see four more clients each at $100 an hour because I was doing all of that work in the client session, I win. And so do those extra four clients. They win too because I had time to see them. I wasn't having to put them off for a couple of weeks because, well, I've booked the entire afternoon to do client research. Do you see where I'm coming from? Is this making sense? Let's have you raise your hand if this is making sense. Yeah? Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So we're going to be, oh, and we're going to stop, stop overwhelming your clients with, um, I think I'm missing one line on my slide. Yes, there we go. Stop overwhelming your clients. We're going to give them homework that they can actually achieve from appointment to appointment so they can feel successful. I ran into, I had a client years and years ago when I was first starting out before I had figured all of this out. And we'd done an iris assessment. I'd written her up a beautiful report on my own time, just saying I've been there. She came back and I gave her six months worth of homework in one session. And I broke it down. I said month one, month two, month three, month four, month five, month six. That's how you're going to do it. And I never saw her again. Now, we happened to travel in some of the same circles. So we ran into each other at a, some kind of a course or a workshop. Years later, this is like four or five years later, and she said, did you ever wonder why I didn't come back? I went, yeah, I did. And she said, because I couldn't do it all. I could never be as perfect as you wanted me to be, and I couldn't admit that to you. And it was like, oh, fail, right? But I've learned, yeah, don't do that. Just don't. Just don't. So does it sound too good to be true? that we could have a modality that would help us to simplify our work, give us clarity in our work, help us be more precise in our work, save us time and help us to increase our income. If that sounds too good to be true, let's have you raise your hand. Yeah, all right, thank you. Some of you I think are converted already, so this is good, this is good, thank you. Really appreciate that. So, you know, I, I, a couple of years ago when I was first starting to teach these iridology courses the way I teach them now, I had a student in the class and she and I were having a conversation and she had a client in that day. It was a client who was in her mid 60s but had arthritis. My student at that time had a three page intake form. Now, I've heard of people using 20 page intakes. This student had three pages. And as the client was filling out that very first page, she was complaining about how much it hurt her hands. So we really don't want to torture our clients like that. It's not a good idea. It really isn't. So when we're doing iridology, as with just about every modality, we need equipment, right? If you're an aromatherapist, you need your essential oils and diffusers and bottles and lotions and potions. If you're a herbalist, you probably need an inventory of some kind. If you're a nutritionist, I'm, you might have 
uh, displays or models of things. You might have things to show weights and measures, but you've got tools and you've got equipment. We need tools in iridology as well. To do iridology well, we really need equipment. Now, you look at that and you go, holy Hannah. Yeah, holy Hannah's right. That's $5,000 worth of equipment you're looking at. Is that where I want you to start? Uh uh. Unless you are already certified, do not start here. This is not the right place to start. The right place to start is here and here. So, a good pen light with a good magnifying device that is between 5 and 10x. Don't go over 10x. And, you know, if you can even get an 8x power, that would be even better than a 10x. Why do I say that? Because 10x blows things up so huge that for a new iridologist, you can get kind of disoriented inside the eye like that. So a little bit less magnification is good. I also like my students to have a lighted magnifier like this one. The reason for that is this is one-handed operation. This actually has interchangeable powered lenses. So it's got a 2X, a 3.5, and, and a 10. And so that's kind of nice. It gives you some variety. But we want both of them because they play different roles in what we're going to be doing. Walmart, uh, Staples might have some things like this. Uh, Target, if you're in the States. Amazon. I got this lighted magnifying glass just recently from Amazon here in Canada. So it's readily available for less than $75 Canadian. That's about $0.05 cents American. Just kidding. The conversion is not quite that bad. Um, but for probably about $55 American, you can have everything you need to start doing iridology. And to do it well, I did not own a camera until I'd been an iridologist for about five years. So you don't have to run out and spend a ton. As a matter of fact, this setup here is the very first set of equipment I ever got. It's And I still use it, right? Just the light has burnt out in the flashlight a few times, and I've had to change batteries, of course. But, yeah, you just uh, buy good equipment, and it'll last you a long time. And I love, whoops, I love that handheld stuff. What did I do there? There we go. I love the handheld because it's so portable. I can throw it in my carry-on luggage if I'm flying. And if I'm chatting with someone and they're curious, I can say, yeah, you want me to take a quick look in your eyes and give you just two ideas and a business card, right? Because I do long-distance consultations as well. So there's you can use that handheld in so many ways that you can't use the camera, but the camera chooses it, or the camera uh, rather gives you some extra benefits that the handheld doesn't. So you start where you can. Just before we look at our first iris sign, we're going to do another little quiz because I'd like to make sure you're fully engaged. What kind of equipment do you need to start doing iridology? Start doing iridology. Again, we're a small group, so I need you to all pick an answer. Okay, so far so good. Yay! I love it when everyone gets it right. Thank you. Yeah, you just need a magnifying device and a pen light. You don't need a $5,000 camera. So the first sign we're going to look at to do with heart and circulation is the lipemic diathesis. Now, I just need to give a reminder here that we do not diagnose and we do not prescribe. Right? Diagnosing is naming a disease. If you're not a licensed medical doctor, you don't get to diagnose. And we don't get to prescribe either. Prescribe is to name a cure for said disease. We don't get to do that, not with iridology, not with sclerology. Okay, we can educate, we can assess, we can ask questions, we can suggest, but we never ever diagnose or prescribe. Unless, of course, you want to spend some time somewhere not very comfortable where your family has to bring you lunch in a picnic basket once a week right? You don't want to do that. These are the eyes of a 53-year-old woman. She uh, has severe menopausal hot flashes with sweats and depression. There are no known cardio issues in her family, and there's no family history of heart attack or blocked arteries, but she has developed this heavy white ring around the outside perimeter of the iris. Now, this is one of the most obvious heart circulation markers there is. 
it is this white band, and we'll look at a whole bunch of examples of this. It's also one of the most unique. And I say that because it doesn't follow any of the rules. Most of the marks we look at that are on the iris are actually in the iris fibers. When we look at the sclera, we've got, we're looking at blood vessels in the sclera. When we look at the lipemic diathesis, this is actually in the cornea. So you've got the iris, and then in front of the iris, you have a clear layer called the cornea. The cornea is the only tissue in your body that has no circulation. Because if it had little capillaries crisscrossing it, they would crisscross in front of your pupil, which would mean you would have this vision that would look like you were looking through a net, right? Which is not what you want to do. I guess we get used to it, but at any rate, we don't have that. The lipidic diathesis is both an indicator of the potential condition of the vascular system and an indicator of the potential risk of liver enzyme imbalances. So remember back to your anatomy and physiology that you've done for your nutrition training. And remember that the liver processes all of the fats you ingest, including essential fatty acids, and it processes all your carbs. It turns your carbs into fats if you don't burn them up fast enough. And if the liver doesn't do these jobs properly or if the diet is faulty enough, what happens is we begin to see changes in the blood lipid chemistry. And we see things like cholesterol might be going up and we might see triglycerides going up. We also see that if people are inactive, right? If the fats and carbs are not dealt with properly, the result will be that we get fats circulating in the bloodstream. And these are the kinds of fats that don't belong there, at least not in that quantity. And this can result then in those fats depositing in the arteries. We know so much more holistically about what causes arterial blockages. And it's not just elevated um, cholesterol or elevated triglycerides. There are some other factors there that, that regular medicine doesn't necessarily agree with or understand. Or at least they don't admit to. But as we see these numbers go up, we want to be a little bit careful. Now, the interesting thing about the lipemic diathesis that forms here is those fats we were talking about have been circulating in these fine capillaries in the sclera. And what happens is just as the cornea has to absorb all of its nutrients, sort of almost like by osmosis, in order to stay healthy, it's going to absorb some of the fats that are circulating in the bloodstream. And as it absorbs those fats, they deposit at the outer edge of the cornea. So the lipemic diathesis is both an indicator of the potential of liver enzyme imbalance and potential of vascular issues as well. This is a 53-year-old female. My practice is primarily female. It's probably, I could probably say 95% female, right? And so you're going to see a lot of female pictures here. But this is good because if you've seen any of my um, Instagram posts, things like heart attack symptoms are very different from a man to a woman. So we need to recognize the heart and circulation markers in a woman just as much as we need to recognize them in a man, and maybe even more so. Because if we see these in a woman, it means that we can step in and educate her and potentially prevent a cardiovascular accident of some sort. So again, this is a female age 53, and she is a naturopath. She's also a certified iridologist, which makes it interesting to do her eyes and do an analysis because she knows what I'm going to say, which doesn't always make it easier, right? If she knows what I'm going to say, and she's looked at her own eyes and she's not doing the homework, I know what I'm gonna hear is a list of excuses of why it can't be done. Not what I'm, I'm not happy with that. I'm really not happy with that with someone who knows. At any rate, her father died from a heart attack. This client is also suspected to have had a heart attack about a year prior to these pictures being taken, but she didn't fully recognize the symptoms. And it wasn't until some months later that she was getting some medical uh, checking up done that they checked her heart and discovered there was a little bit of residual damage and they suspect she'd had a heart attack. 
This lipemic diathesis builds over time. It is an acquired sign. We're not usually born with it, but it builds over time. The tendency or the predisposition to build it may be genetic. And we're going to see a family tree of this, of some circulatory things of how things can be genetic. It wasn't lipemic diathesis, it's another marker we'll talk about in a few minutes. We know that elevated cholesterol um, can and elevated blood pressure are two of the key risks for heart attack and stroke, but they are two of, of many. There are a lot of different risk factors, a lot of different things that can impact and increase our risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. We do know that once the cornea has absorbed these fats, even if we do all the right work and we clean out the arteries, we get the diet under control, we get the fats down, everything is just running tickety-boo, the cornea is not going to give these this lipemic diathesis away. It's not going to let these fats disperse. There is no circulation that draws things away to do that for us. So we want to just be aware that this is always going to be there as a reminder to be careful, to mind your manners, to do what's right, right? Here's a set of male eyes. This is a male age 75. No known cardiovascular symptoms, but can you see that lipemic diathesis? And actually for a 75 year old, I'm not going to worry about it too much. He's in good health, he's very active, and he enjoys his alcohol maybe a little too much. He um, is a member of a business club, which is where I met him the first time. And in that business club, when they get together for their meetings, and I think they meet every two weeks, they might even meet every week, hmm, uh, they have an open bar. And everybody in that club drinks two or three or four drinks before they go in to have their dinner and their meetings. So it's, he likes his alcohol, but he's very active. He works in a downtown office as some kind of an advisor, but he also owns a farm. And so on the evenings and weekends, he's out working on his farm. I put him on the bio tracker. If you know what the bio tracker is, it's that uh, bio impedance weight scale where you stand on it and it analyzes your percentage body fat and your percentage muscle and your overall weight and it gives you a biological age. This guy had the best numbers of anybody in that group and he's the oldest. Most of the people in that group are 10 to 15 years younger and their numbers were way worse. His biological age was 40. So who am I to say, you know, clean up your act, mister? At any rate, when we look at his lipemic diathesis, and we remember how the liver has to deal with everything. And we understand how the liver it deals with the alcohol, especially, and alcohol is really hard on the liver. We have to wonder then if that is a part of why this gentleman has the lipemic diathesis. He, um, we also need to remember that things like elevated triglycerides correlate strongly with metabolic syndrome. Well, he doesn't seem to have metabolic syndrome. One of the key indicators of that is the waist in a man that's over 40 inches. His was nowhere near 40. I think his was maybe 35 or 36, which for a 75 year old man is really, really decent. So as we chatted about his eyes and talked about the lipemic diathesis and I taught him what it meant, I suggested he might wanna go a little easier on the alcohol and his response was flat out, no way. I like my alcohol. I'm going to keep doing it. I got to 75 doing it. I'm not stopping. Give me any other piece of homework, but not that. So, you know, what do you do? You just love him. You've given him the education. It's his choice. So as we've seen in other images, that lipemic diathesis, diathesis can go all the way around the iris, but it doesn't have to. Sometimes it's partial like it is in this eye. These are the eyes of a 24-year-old Asian male. Now, I only bring up Asian because of his diet. And I'm going to tell you about that in a moment. Do you see here that this is ever such a slight touch of fuzzy, foggy, moving towards white-ish? Can you see that? If you can see that, let's have you raise your hand. Just at the, the northern border of this eye. Excellent. Thank you. This is the early stages of a lipemic diathesis. Now, typically, if we see a lipemic diathesis in someone who's over 60, and if we've been able to track this all along, and it's only just starting and they're over 60, we go, 
natural aging of the cornea, probably nothing to worry about. If they're between 40 and 60 and we see a lipemic diathesis, we go, yeah, maybe need to get those ducks in a row. This young man is only 24. He's got this starting. He's headed for trouble. And I can't diagnose and I can't prescribe, but I know what this means, right? And you do now too. He's Asian. He moved here when he was a young child. But his family still eats predominantly Asian. Now that he doesn't live with them, he's retained the easy from the Asian, which is that pot of white rice always on the stove, and the worst of North American, which is junk food and fast food. Now, you've all got nutrition training. Tell me on a scale of 0 to 10, with 10 being optimal diet, 0 being um, horrible diet, white rice and junk food, is that horrible? So a 0 or is it somewhere up or is it 10? Is it perfect? Let's have you type that into the comments section. And I don't mind if you're as harsh as you want to be on this. <laughs> yeah, Larissa, thank you for answering. I think you I think everybody will agree with you if they typed it in. It's a zero. Pure refined carbohydrates. This young man is about 30 pounds overweight. And I see him quite often because he's a he's actually my son-in-law. And I have to, my daughter is doing a remarkable job of gradually shifting their diet and encouraging him to eat better. He'll now eat vegetables, which he wouldn't when he joined the family originally. So um, this is all good. So again, he's young. He's had gout since he was 17. Are you getting a picture of some of the issues that might be going on in his body? And so we really need to work with him. We see this at such a young age. We can avert problems if we can get him on side to do some homework, actually to completely change his lifestyle, right? He's kind of sedentary as well. So we got to work on that. This is a female age 72. Some of these clients that are older have been with me for like 20 or 25 years. They started with me when I was pretty young at this. She drinks eight cups of coffee per day, and she's another one of those that when we looked at her eyes, we saw that lipemic diathesis, and in her, it's heavier at the top, but it does go all the way around. We talked about why would she have this. We talked about how it was liver enzymes, how coffee is hard on the liver, and it might be a good idea for her to reduce her coffee intake, and her answer was a flat out, no way. Okay, then. I understood that. No means no. Got it. I'm not really worried about her. Why not? Because she's active. She's retired from work. She's got horses. She spends a lot of time outside with her horses, training them, breaking them, grooming them, feeding them, all kinds of stuff. So she's really physically active. She's probably stronger than I am by, by a lot. And so I'm not too, too worried. We have talked about her need to eat more like her horses that just as they in the summertime will scrounge and eat the greens that are on the ground, she needs to eat greens not off the ground, but she needs a lot more green in her diet. So hopefully she's working on that some as well. I also want you to take a look at this lower corner here. We're going to look at another set of eyes. Again, she's been with me for many years. And you can see that close to the pupil, there is uh, a vein that is quite heavy, right? That arrow is pointing to it. Look at these pictures that were done six years prior. Look at that same vein down here. Do you see it? Do you see how much lighter it is? We're going to do a bit of sclerology today. And as we do that, what you're going to see, uh, hopefully learn, is that the vessels in the sclera are more dynamic than the structure of the eye. The structure of the eye is not going to change. So the fibers in the iris are there to stay. They're not going to change. But the structure of the vessels, they can expand and become broken down. They can shrink and become healthier and stronger. So we're going to be working with that a little bit as we go through things. Let's jump back to the lipemic diathesis now. This is a female age 60. Look at her lipemic diathesis. 
When we see a lipemic diathesis, it makes us ask several questions. And in amongst those questions are things like, is there a personal or family history of liver issues? Is there a personal or family history of heart attack, stroke, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, any of the vascular complaints? Are you prone to cold hands and or cold feet, fuzzy thinking, or poor memory? Now, if this client says she has, she knows she has liver issues of some description, what would you suggest she do for that? Let's have you type in some, some answers into the chat box there, into your questions box. What kinds of things would you recommend for someone who knows their liver's not quite right? I'll give you just a second to do that. Lightning fingers. This is where we play the Jeopardy music, right? Do, 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 do. And we'll give those answers just a second to come in. Point form is great. I read phonetics, so if you've made a spelling mistake, don't worry about it. I can figure it out. The faster I type, the worse my typing is, right? Diet change, yeah. Now, AJ, is that, I hope that's how you pronounce your name. Um, can you give me one or two specifics of diet change? Because diet change is a big piece of homework. It's actually kind of scary. Ah, oh, Larissa has jumped in. Excellent. And she's saying greens, whole foods, healthy fats. Those are great suggestions. Yeah, good thinking, good thinking. That's exactly the direction we want to go. And I know we can get more specific in that. We just don't have time to do it tonight. So you're beginning to see how you can take what you see in the eye and we don't have the concerns we don't have the list of what the client was interested in but we're going to assume we did and we've looked in their eyes we've asked questions about liver about circulation about memory about family history and so you begin to see how this all can tie in in iridology in my course, Confident Nutritionist, Dynamic Iridologist, you will learn how to create programs right in your sessions and eliminate the unpaid homework time by integrating your existing modalities with iridology. You're going to learn how to do a base assessment in five minutes or less without a lengthy intake paperwork and save time and do a better intake assessment. I'm going to demo a five-minute analysis at the end of this, this um session today. You'll only ask questions that are relevant to your client's needs. That's what drives me nuts about those huge long questionnaires. Is I go, no, 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 no. And maybe those questionnaires are good for people who are breaking apart and have a million health issues. But I can list my health, health issues on two fingers, right? I know what they are. I'm working on them. There you go. You can prioritize your problems. The pl the your problems, no, not your problems, the problems your client needs help with. Really important that you put those in the right order because if you put them in the wrong order, they're not going to get the best results. You'll be able to create doable pieces of homework that will help your clients be more successful, right? And that keeps them coming back. You will be able to, um, I'm sorry, my screen is blocked here. Uh, yeah, okay. Do a deeper assessment for more direction and understanding of your client's needs when needed. So that's really cool, right? It helps to simplify the whole process. I have another little quiz for you here, another little poll. Mm, yeah, I do. And this is it. Again, making sure you got what I taught. A lipemic diathesis suggests which of the following, and you can choose two. Which two things? Yeah. Okay, so far so good. We got one person voted. There's only three of you on the call with me today. Hopefully you haven't, someone hasn't had to step away from their computer. There we go, thank you. And you all got it perfect again. That's wonderful. Good students tonight, I love that. All right. Circulatory ring, this is the next iris sign we want to talk about. It's not iris, it's sclera. This is truly sclera. So what we are looking at is this pinky, moby, purpley, bluey 
it could look like a lot of different colors on your computer screen. I've got one screen where it's blue, blue, and on the screen I'm teaching on, it's actually purple. So it could be any of those colors. And so we want to be very aware that the circulatory ring, again, is largely inherited, and we're going to look at a family history with this. This is a female age 48. The That blue mauve color, purpley color is the circulatory ring. And this is a true genetic sign. It's inherited along with the potentials it suggests. It might go all the way around, or it might just be around a part of the, the edge of the iris. So it can be like the lipemic diathesis. It doesn't have to be complete. The analogy here is if you see someone whose lips are turning blue, you know they're not getting enough oxygen, right? Well, when we see this blue halo or this purple halo around the iris, it means that their body is, that part of the body is not getting enough oxygen either, probably. Here's a female who's age 72. And it's a little bit hard to see that circulatory ring on her eyes because of the lighting. We've got more of it over here on the lateral aspect of her right eye. So these are as if we're looking at her, her nose is in the middle. She's sitting across the table from us. So let's look at them from a different angle. When I had her lift her lid and look down and I took a picture, we can see how much blue there is at the top here. All right, we're going to do another little quiz. This goes right back to the beginning of our presentation today. With iridology, we cannot choose two of them. Cannot do what? Cannot do what? Yay, so far so good. Yay, fabulous. See, the beauty of this is when you come into my course, you've got the foundation. I don't have to make sure you've got this right. We're going to look at the family study of a circulatory ring. These are the eyes of a 10-year-old boy. Can you see the circulatory ring here? If you can, let's have you raise your hand. I just want to make sure everyone's got a computer monitor where this is obvious. Yeah, yeah? Perfect. Thank you so much. Now, I've got four generations of his family as clients and photographs of three of those generations, but we also know the family history going back to his great, great, great grandparents. This family knows their stuff. Makes it so fascinating to work with them and be able to put these pieces together. Now, a circulatory ring, while it's genetic, can fade or it can get darker. So we can actually have a bit of an influence on this. Let's look at this young boy's parents. This is his father. Can you see that bit of a purpley haze hanging on around the edge? Okay. This is his mom. Again, this looks really purple. Really purple. It's very pretty. It's too bad it's not such a healthy thing, right? Really purple. All right. Let's look at the father's father. This is the father's father. Can you see the circulatory ring in here? Let's look at the father's mother. This is so great. I love that you're weighing in on this. See the father's mother? Not, yeah, the father's mother. So this is the grandmother, the paternal grandmother of this little 10-year-old boy. And she's got a bit of that, that ring at the top. So the mother is 59 and the father is almost 64, but these photos were done about a year ago. I actually was able to get these three generations together in my office to do the photos all on the same day. It was pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. So then we want to look at the rest of the history. Here is the 10-year-old boy again. Okay, this is the 10-year-old boy. This is his mom, or his dad rather, and his mom. This is the father's parents. Now, the father's father has had a major stroke about eight years ago and has not recovered and never will. Has recovered somewhat, 
but certainly is nothing what he was before the stroke. This is the mother's father. He's had two heart attacks, has heart failure, and has COPD. His father had two heart attacks. His mother had no heart problems that were known. But the, the great, great, great grandparents, now we've got one that had a heart attack and uh, a father and a mother that had a heart attack. And even this mother's mother had a heart attack. So we can see how this has funneled all the way down through the one side of the family. And now because the child's father married a woman who also has it, that child has a risk of this. Now, to this family's credit, this generation, the child's grandparents, are the ones who started making changes. Before they actually had their son, they had done some major dietary changes. So hopefully, they've been able to weaken this link. And then this, the child's parents are very diet conscious. They do drink a little bit. But overall, their food is incredible, very conscientious. And so there's a chance that the whole cycle has been weakened again down to the next generation. All right, was that cool? If that was cool, let's have you raise your hand. Yeah, way cool. I love doing, thank you so much. I love doing the multi-generational -gener stuff. And now I've actually got quite a few three-generation families that are coming to me where I took care of the mom when she was pregnant. And now her children are having children, so I'm getting the three generations, so it's really cool. So if you want to keep learning really great stuff like this, I'm going to invite you to join me for Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology. The next session is coming up really quick. It's starting Thursday. We've been promoting this for a couple of weeks, uh, months, actually, and you've got a choice of two times, five, or sorry, 11 a.m. Mountain Time, or 5 p.m. Mountain Time. So tonight we started at 6, so that helps you figure out what time it is in your time zone. And space is limited. I keep my classes small on purpose. I want my students to have enough individual attention that we can make sure that if they choose to certify, that they have the optimal chance of actually passing their exams on the first go round. So important, so important. So I'm going to invite you to go to that URL that you see at the bottom of the page, bookmark it. Don't hang out there, just bookmark it so you can go back to it in a few minutes. What will that course contain? It's going to cover beginning to eat intermediate iridology and sclerology, both of those at a level that will prepare you for the IPA certification exam if you choose to do that. Now, IPA charges a fee for their exam. That doesn't come through me. I have nothing to do with it. I just teach the curriculum. And it's also going to include basic nutrition and herbology as they relate to iridology. Okay, You need to know that when I teach that class, I teach it from the foundations up. So if you've got a background in iridology, you're going to get some refresher but you're also going to get a lot more that's super meaty. If you're brand new to iridology, don't run screaming because I will take make sure that you get what you need. I will take special care of you to make sure that it totally makes sense. So you just need to be clear that I'm not going to teach nutrition and I'm not teaching herbology, but I'm going to tie them in. So whatever information you bring in, we are going to build that into your iridology program. So what's included in this course? It is 20 sessions done as live webinars, just like this one, except that they're about two hours long each. Each class is recorded in its entirety and posted on the student website that you have access to. The content is also edited into topics. So if we covered seven different markers in one class, each one of those markers has its own mini video they are stored on your student site as well. So if you've missed a class, you can go back and listen to the full recording. If you just need to review a topic, you just listen to that. Um, and it says on the screen for 18 months, and that's because at the end of 18 months, I migrate you to an alumni site that has all of the content as well. 
and I just keep that one up to date rather than having to update new sites for all of the student groups that have gone through. Keeps my life simpler and that's happier and all that good stuff. You get a digital textbook that's made available in weekly installments. It's a textbook that I wrote. I know the content of it backwards, forwards, inside out and upside down and can help you with any questions you might have, of course. We have cheat sheets. Now the textbook is about 160 pages long and the cheat sheets are about 50 pages long. So what we've done is we've taken all of the content of the course, turned it into point form notes. Cole's notes, if you're from my generation, we used to call them Cole's notes. That was the synoptic version, the cheat sheet version. So that you can keep this at the ready in a binder when you're working with a client. And if you've got it properly indexed, you can flip through, find what you need really fast, and you've got it ready to go. Each class starts with a review of the previous week. We build on previous concepts, so we need to make sure that what we covered last week is really solid. Sometimes when my students are reviewing, and I love it when they do this, we'll be eight or ten weeks into the class and someone will go, can we go back to lesson three? There's something there that I'm not, I'm not really feeling solid with. Yeah, we can go back to lesson three. Let's flip back, do that review, get you solid, and come back to where we were supposed to be for today and make sure that we're good to go. I love it when my, my students need me to go back because it means they're studying and they're using it and they're thinking about it. They're not just going, yeah, that's what she said. They're using it and thinking about it. That is so important. Each week has a lot of in-class practice and interaction. Unlike today's webinar where your lines are muted, in the classes your lines are unmuted so that we can have a constant dialogue back and forth. I can ask questions, you can ask questions, we can share answers, we can just make sure that we're solid and have a conversation. It also helps with that sense of community if you can hear the other students' voices and I find it just really helps to make for a cohesive support unit. You get a certificate of attendance for attending 80% of the classes live. I'm pretty lenient on that and the reason I say that is because we've recorded the entire class for you to listen to when you need to. And you can ask for, for help through a Facebook page that I'll tell you about in a moment and through an office hours calls that we have. So if you have to miss a class, I'm not really, I don't sweat it. We have a private Facebook book group just for my students and my alumni. And as soon as you register for the course, you're invited to join us and to say hello and to feel how warm and friendly the group is. We're a very supportive group, not overly active on the site just yet because our group is small but it is growing and that's exciting. And we have a monthly office hours call where students submit either written descriptions of cases they're working on or if they've got a way to take photos. You know, a smartphone does an okay photo for us to work from in office hours. So if you've got a smartphone and can manage the lighting in the room so we don't get a lot of glare, then you can do photos of people you're, you're working with and send them in and we can talk about them and help you assess them so that you can be of more value to your clients perhaps. All right, so again, the format of each class is review, introduce new content and practice everything we've covered so far, right? So what is a course like this worth? What is a course like this worth? And I'm encouraging you to get registered today because registration closes tonight at 9 p.m. Mountain Time. If you know right now that you want all of the curriculum, all of the training and the certification preparation, I'll explain that in a moment, then you want this package. And this package is $19.95 Canadian. Now the US dollar is trading about 25 to 30% stronger than the Canadian dollar. So when you pay for your course, it's going to come out somewhere between $14.95 and $15.95 probably. In this course, you get the complete curriculum. And because I'm a certified instructor, you also get, I will also administer IPA exam part one and part two for you. And that's a lot of practicum in that that we do. Then when you're ready to move on and do part three, that's where you whoops, apply to IPA and they send you the, the final, final written exam. If you're thinking, I don't know if I want to certify. I'm already certified somewhere else. I just want the information. Or maybe you're thinking, yeah, I want to certify, but I don't want pressure. I don't want to have to do it right away. That's fine. You can opt for the course content only. 
It's the exact same curriculum, the exact same 20 lessons as everything else. It's just that you haven't, don't have access to the IPA exam part one and part two. I have a lot of people who do that. And then once they finish the course and they've practiced for a while, then they feel like they're ready to move forward with the iPad. And I have a package for that as well. So if you opt for the course only, that's just fine. Because it means that later on, if you want, you can buy the exam prep package. Not a problem. Not a problem at all. Oh, let's do some more sclerology. Let's do some more sclerology. All right. But first, let's do a quiz. Let's do a quiz because I like quizzes. Um, here we go. And we want this one. The circulatory ring, and you can choose two answers. Which two answers look the best in your opinion? Circulatory ring. Good. So far, so good. Yay. Yay. Okay, the pressure's on for the third person to not blow it, right? <laughs> Just having fun with you. Just having fun with you. Because if someone did choose a wrong answer, it gives me another opportunity to teach that material again, right? That's how I look at answers that are not correct on the first go. And so we're going to close out on this. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so everybody got it right. It always suggests an increased risk of circulatory um, circulatory insufficiency, and it's usually blue or mauve. So well done, well done. The next indicator we want to look at is called the meandering vessel. This is the eye of a male, 75-year-old male. And I want you to imagine you're in a helicopter. You're flying over some farmland that is maybe in the foothills, like where I live, and there's lots of rivers and streams that run down out of the mountains. And as they wind through the farmland, they serpentine their way through. They meander, right? Well, blood vessels do that in our eyes as well. So the iris shows pretty much exclusively genetic traits. It has some ability, ability to acquire some traits, but it's mostly genetic. The sclera shows us things that are mostly dynamic. So it shows us what's going on in the body now. And it may show us what's going on before the problems become clinical. This is our early warning device, right? So if we are monitoring our client's eyes, preferably with photography, preferably with the same camera, the same lighting from one session to the next, we want to be doing those photos of the sclera probably every six months no further apart than every 12 months, because we saw that other sclera where that one vessel had gotten definitely thicker over six years, right? So when we see varicose veins in somebody's legs, what do you think of? What do varicose veins tell you about that person? Let's have you type that in. What do varicose veins tell you about that person? Give you just a minute, we'll play the music again. What do varicose veins tell you about the person? Yeah, AJ, good, yeah. Oh, Larissa, I like that. Oh, she's getting very cool on us. Okay, we'll share these. Yeah, these are great answers. AJ says decreased circulation. Absolutely. There's an insufficiency. The blood's not moving. It's pooling. It's stretching those veins. And Larissa, oh, we would have fun in class. We would. And I'd have fun with all of you. But comments like this get me excited. They're not following their dream. I love working with the emotional root of issues as well. And we often will pull that into the iridology class too. Not following their dream. Absolutely. So on the physical level, it means that the tissues are breaking down, that the collagen structure is letting go. It's not holding things. Uh, if the veins are in the lower leg, it means the person's feeling stuck. They can't move forward, and that circulation is not moving forward either. So these veins in the eyes are pretty much like varicose veins in the body. 
and it tells us that the circulation is congested, that the vessels are breaking down. These don't usually bulge the way varicose veins do, but they can, they can. Here's another male, age 60, and see his, his, uh, his meandering vessels as well. He's got a few of them. Now notice the difference. We've got one here that is very light, one here that's very heavy. The heavier one is the more congested one, and it's usually the one that's more chronic. It's going to take a lot more work on his circulation to get this to quiet down. This one is probably newer. It's not as broken down. It's not going to take as much work at all to get it calmed down. So we want to be aware of that, to work with these. What kinds of things would you recommend for someone who has some circulatory compromises that might be calling, causing varicose veins in their legs, for instance? I'm going to get you typing things in here. Herbal supplements. Yeah, AJ, there are some very good herbal supplements that can benefit this. Absolutely. There are even foods that you can do, right, that will support the circulatory system. And those are the directions we want to go. And if someone else is typing, keep typing. I will come back to your comment because we are on this topic for a few more minutes. So meandering vessels beg the questions on the physical level of does the client have varicose veins or hemorrhoids, which are, of course, just varicose veins of the behind. And does the client have any hernias? Because that's a breakdown of collagen as well. And you could even go so far as to ask about um, connective tissues and joints and predisposition to loose joints and things like that. Larissa says suggest physical activity. Absolutely. Get them moving physically. Yes, Larissa, I totally agree. Well done. Well done. This is a 12-year-old. No, that's the wrong picture. Not a 12-year-old. Whoops. This is the 12-year-old boy. 12-year-old boy. So you see meandering vessels a lot in people who are older, and the older they get, the more you see them, the thicker they are. However, this child has a definite meandering vessel. Can you see it? If you can spot that meandering vessel, let's have you raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, good, yeah, excellent. So hopefully this is the one you were seeing. Well done, thank you. And so we need to even maybe start at a very young age. You know, maybe he's been a little too sedentary maybe he wants to do a sport that his parents are not keen on. So he's feeling held back. He's not achieving his dreams. Maybe the diet needs some work. So we need to explore those things. But when we see the meandering vessel, we can ask about the personal and family history. We can ask about diet and we can start crafting what we need, what he needs to learn in order to keep this from getting any worse and maybe backtrack it. That's what I love doing iridology with kids. I really do because it gives me the opportunity to begin coaching and molding them with their parents' support, of course. Now, I've got a lot of students who've done confident nutritionist dynamic iridology, and I want to share with you some of what they've said. This is Michelle Davies. She came to me with a ton of iridology training under her belt already from Dr. Pesek and from Darko Purse. And this is what she said about our course. This is the most amazing iridology course I've taken. Holy Hannah, out of all of the other ones, this was it for her. Judith's course is top on my list. Judith is very enthusiastic and excited as we are in the class. She has many good examples and stories to share that makes the course that much more real in today's world. Judith's iridology course is very informative, descriptive, and complete as it contains the most accurate iridology, including sclerology, and most importantly, how to put it all together to make a proper assessment. I feel most confident in my nutritional practice now. Now, Michelle had opted for the certification prep package, and she did the first two exams, and then she said she was going to quit. She wasn't going to do the final one. We had a little chat, and I don't strong arm anybody. It's not like I bullied her. 
but I kind of got in there and I said, Michelle, I know you've, you know, there had been some things happen in her year and she worked hard, but she'd done well in my course. And I said, you need to do this. You need to finish this because if you don't, you're always going to wonder, could you have? And so she, um, she did. And this is what she said after she certified. Woohoo, this is so amazing to become certified. It was a great journey through Judith's classes and extended webinar tutoring. Her faith and personal care really made the difference and encouraged me to the finish line. And that personal care is why I keep my classes small. But it doesn't end here. I have gained confidence in myself in promoting good health through nutrition, lifestyle, and personal awareness for optimal health. I just love that. I thought that was so awesome that she finished it, even though it was hard, and she did a great job. Um, and I want to do another little quiz with you, but I've lost my quiz thing. Oops, now I've really lost my quizzes. There we go. Okay. There it is. So I want to know from you, please, pretty please, about the sclera. The sclera in choose two answers shows primarily genetic predispositions or primarily shows earned conditions, often suggests issues that are preclinical, can be used to diagnose health problems. Which answers do you think are the best? Good job. Yeah, huh? Oh, is it only letting you choose one? Oh, darn. I didn't. Oh, no, there we go. Okay, because you can choose two answers on this. So far, so good. Okay, so everyone who's voted so far is great. And you must only be able to choose one because it shows everyone's voted. So primarily shows earned conditions and often suggests issues that are um, preclinical. Well done. And I appreciate one of you actually switched your answer. So you got the second answer on there too. So thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. It's one way to get around it. Another student said this. This is Karen Choate. She said, thank you, Judith. And this is while she was still in the class. Um, and I just need to make sure that you're seeing this. There we go. Not quite. Almost. I'll start reading. There we go. While she was in the class, she said, it's been such a pleasure studying under you and learning from you. She's right at the end. I really miss our classes. Oh, this was after. But I'm looking forward to completing this component of iridology and continuing my education most hopefully with you. And yes, I am creating more courses, some more advanced iridology courses and some herb courses as well that will be coming. Some of them will be starting probably in the fall, I hope. Um, I have become much more comfortable with taking photos of my patient's eyes and have begun to implement this incredible work in my practice quite successfully. It truly has helped immensely in my decisions and assessments. Thank you for sharing your skills, your knowledge, and your patience. And then she did her certification, and when she finished that, this is what she said. Thank you, Judith. I'm so very happy. This is a dream realized, and I am so very thankful that I had the best teacher to educate me forever grateful, Karen Choate. She came in with a ton of training as a certified natural health practitioner. And she really loved what she learned here. So that was very cool. One of, and this is the last testimonial, and then we're gonna get back to some eyes, but this is also a sweet one. This is Helen Murdoch from Florida. Helen is a midwife, and she is also a registered nurse. I've been looking for a while for the right iridology course. I knew immediately when I saw Judith that this is it. Her inclusion of, inclusion of nutrition and herbs was definitely a winner. So many teachers teach iridology as, iridology as just iridology, and they don't tie in any of the other modalities. I've had students come to me, we'll pick up with this one in just a second, come to me having done those classes, and, you know, they, they want some mentoring. So I'll talk to anybody for an hour. You book an hour. You don't have to pay for it. You come in. You sit with me. And they say, well, how do I start a business? Well, what other training do you have? Well, I've got iridology. What other training do you have? Nothing. Well, you can't. That's like saying your car is making a noise. I know it's, it, I know it's the fan belt, but I can't fix it for you. 
right? So you can't do it without everything. So this is what, what Helen was looking for, someone who could integrate what she already knew. Judith's teaching style is most interactive as she engages us, the students, in lively discussions. Judith's knowledge base is so all-encompassing, we, the students, believe she knows everything. <laughs> she operates like a coach with her use of motivational inquiry to help build our confidence as well as professionals. The content of this course is so diverse, so much more than I'd expected from an iridology course. I strongly recommend Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology, even to the curious. So she's just wrapping up her coursework, and um, I did not mean to do that. There we go. And so hopefully she will be doing her certification soon. So again, tuition is 1995. Oops, letting the cat out of the bag here. And some of you might be saying, okay, the class starts Thursday. I want to do it. Don't have quite that much money sitting in my back pocket. Do you have a payment plan? The answer is yes. Yes, I do. I love payment plans. If you want the full thing with the certification prep, that's a four pay of 549 Canadian a month. If you want curriculum only, no certification prep, that's a four pay of 419 a month. All right, so it makes it really way more affordable. If you want to opt for the four pay, go to the URL confidentnutritionist.com, scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page. And under the very last two big yellow, I want to register buttons, you will see a text link that says, I would rather make four payments. That's where you're going to click and that will get you in. Now, when you do this, when you make that first payment, you're going to receive an email back from me right away that has a form attached to it. You need to print up that form, fill it in, and either scan it or take really good photographs of it and email those back to me. Okay, email them as an attachment, not in the body of the email. And then I finish your, your registration manually. And that's why registration closes tonight. So I've got time tomorrow to finish up the last bits of paperwork for people who register tonight. Okay, and as soon as I get that in, I get you linked up with the course and send you the way to get that all connected. And I get you invited to our Facebook group so you can introduce yourself and see what a wonderful, warm, friendly group we are and get you kind of getting your feet wet with us. Now with sclerology, we talked about that, um, that serpentine vessel, that meandering vessel, right? If that vessel gets really, really engorged, and this is just like with a varicose vein, sometimes they stay below the surface, but you can see them. Sometimes they get big and they pop through the surface of the skin, right? Sorry, I've been teaching so much today, my voice is starting to go and I've got a tickle in my throat, so I'm trying to not cough in your ear here. When that vessel in the eye, when that meandering vessel becomes so thick, that it now is bulging out of the surface of the eye, just like a big varicose vein in the leg, it changes that surface of the eye. And what it does, and how you'll see this show up most clearly is, you will see that the side of that vessel will catch the light. Can you see how with the light coming from here, it's catching on this edge? If you can see that, I want you to raise your hand. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So that means, of course, that we've got more work to do. And this is sort of the comparison. This is why we call it a porcelain vessel. If we're working with actual China, where they have fired the greenware plain with no decoration on it to begin with, it comes out fully baked, and you could actually use it that way almost, but then they put the glaze on in layers. They put one layer on, they put that in, and they fire it. They bring it out, they put another layer on, and then they fire it again. And if you've ever felt this kind of porcelain, the surface has a texture because the glaze doesn't soak in. It sits on the top and it bonds to whatever is beneath it. And that, that texture is very much like the texture that's created by the porcelain vessels. So the porcelain vessel is not a hugely common indicator. 
But when you see it, you need to be aware that this portends an increased risk of thrombosis. Okay, so that's pretty serious, pretty serious. So if you see this, you're going to want to get in there and very gently and carefully and methodically work with things that will begin to break down any potential buildup they've got in their arteries. And you do that slowly and carefully because if you break a chunk off, you just created a thrombosis for this person. You want to disintegrate it slowly, like sand washing away out of a sand pile rather than like breaking off bricks and chunks and sending those down. Most people don't have obvious symptoms of circular, circulatory problems, and if they don't have obvious symptoms, they don't want to admit that there could be a problem brewing. Who, me? No way. I do blood pressure here in my office, and the number of people where I'm the one who discovers that their blood pressure is elevated because they never go to the doctor, and I'm okay with that, but they've never thought to check their blood pressure. So I'm the one who has to say your blood pressure is way up. I legally can't diagnose that, but you can see the numbers on the machine, and the number should be down here, not way up there. And I legally have to tell you, you need to seek medical attention, but I'm happy to do things to help improve your health in any direction you would like me to help you with it right? So as holistic practitioners, it's our job to gently but firmly educate our clients as to what we see in their eyes and what it means and what they can do about it. And we have the advantage with sclerology because we can combine what we see in their sclera with what we see in their iris with the answers to the questions that we ask them. And we can come up with a very thorough picture. This person likely that you're looking at on at the screen likely doesn't know they've got a problem well they do because they're my client but they likely didn't know before they came to see me and again there's so much that you see in an eye you can't possibly cover the whole iris reading in one session you can't possibly cover all of the homework in one session so you need to start with the things that are the most important to your client and or the most critical based on your assessment these are the eyes of a 20-year-old female. Now, I put them in here just because, you know, sometimes we think, can I really see that much? Well, when you know iridology, there are things that you could see in this eye from three feet away. Seriously, you could do a mini assessment from across a dining room table. And I've actually done that for you know, business meetings. People say, well, what can you tell me? And if I can get good lighting and they're a couple feet away, I can tell them things. I can ask them things is actually more appropriate. So uh, with this person, I would notice, obviously, blue eyes, beautiful blue eyes, right? That tells me she's a little bit prone to being over acid in her system. And then I would be able to see these large flower petal shapes in her eyes. So I know that she is at risk of hormonal issues. So I'm going to ask her, do you have any issues with hormones? And she answers because she was in my office. And when I asked her that, she said, yeah. I've got incredible menstrual cramps. Okay, we can ride with that. And then I noticed that we had this ring. We've got actually two parts. We've got a dark band here, which didn't show up from three feet away. But we've got this other band here. These both correlate to stomach. So I ask about digestion. How's your digestion? And she gave me answers. And I look at how thickened these fibers are, how they're all milky and veiled. So I can ask about mucus congestion, inflammation, arthritis, things like that. And she can give me answers. I look and I see she's got this beautiful frame of dark blue around the edge of her eyes. So I ask her, how's your skin? Any skin issues? Right. Then I notice she has a meander. Right. She's got a meander. So I'm going to ask about personal or family history of vascular issues, of insufficiencies, of herniations or things like that, of varicose veins. And... Uh, there are some 20 year olds who have them and I get over here and you know, we, we just start picking apart these other little markers. There's lots more in the eye as well, based on where things are placed. So even from a few feet away, we can start creating that mental list of, of questions we would ask so that we can put together that intake history from what we're seeing in the eyes. So again, registration closes at 9 o'clock tonight. 
So you might want to make a note of this URL. And as you've seen, we don't get hung up on just herbs or just food. We're going to incorporate all of that and lifestyle stuff and emotional stuff. We develop the flesh out the course, however the students want it to be fleshed out. You get the curriculum, but you bring in things that we build on as well. So it doesn't matter what color the iris is. We can always, always find things to teach our clients about, find questions to ask them, whether we're looking at the iris or the sclera. So this person has a creative streak. We've actually seen her eyes once, and we looked at some blood vessels that were down here. But she's got a creative streak. We see all of these lacuna, these flower petals in here. That's all about creativity. Um, some of the petals are darker. That shows us that there's organs that have a lower reactivity level. We, all of these flower petals also suggest she may have an issue with some blood sugar imbalances. We notice that the area hugging her pupil is quite a bit darker. We're going to ask about her digestion and how that's working for her. So we can cover so much. And by the end of the course, you'll know all of that. You'll also know what it means when we have a blood vessel like this. And if this eye was open further, this is a picture that's six years old, you would see this blood vessel actually completely circumnavigates her eyes. And you'd understand what that means and why I'm a little concerned for her. We've looked mostly, oh, I meant to take that out. Ignore this URL at the top of the page. It is incorrect. Do not look at that. Okay, I just made you look at it. Sorry. It should just be confidentnutritionist.com. Take out the iridology.education. I apologize for that. Um, but, you know, we've looked at a lot of light colored eyes because they're so much easier to read, or so we think. So we think. What can we see in a dark eye, like these beautiful dark hematogenic eyes? We can see a predisposition towards some stomach insufficiencies. We can see the tone of the intestinal tract. We can see if there's some issues with some of the glands and the hormone producing parts. There may be some issues with liver and blood building. This person spends a lot of time working in the sympathetic reaction zone. A little bit of a circulatory ring here. And we've got a little bit of some little capillaries hanging onto the edge, which teach us that they might be prone to some allergies. What about this person? This is a female who's 35 years old. She's got polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so when we look at this, we see that she also has some digestive insufficiency. It's a very common problem. We see that she has some interruption in the nerve feed, in her nervous system, and that she too spends a lot of time in that sympathetic reaction field. She's a lipemic diathesis. She's only 35. What are, what's her liver doing? How does the liver interact with her hormone creation? Could liver be a part of the PCOS? You betcha. You betcha. And all of these blood vessels that are hugging the edge of her iris, they tell us, again, a story about her risk of certain kinds of allergies. So we can see volumes in a dark brown eye. The dark brown doesn't need to scare anybody. Tons of information there. So why would you want to study with me? Well, because I've been where you are. I understand the financial and time constraints of running a business, taking care of a family, home, friends, and other important commitments. Remember, I did this while I was having and raising seven children. I know busy. I know busy. I know busy really well. Now that my kids are all grown and moved out, my parents are aging and they're not aging so well. They live an hour and a half away. I spend several hours every week on the highway going out to help my parents because that's what we do, right? We love them. We take care of them as best we can. I understand learning needs. We all don't learn in the same way. I Actually, I went to university and I almost finished my teaching degree, but decided not to when I married my husband. So I know a little bit about teaching. I've been teaching all my life. I understand that there's a lot to learn about iridology and sclerology, and it can be overwhelming. So I've got a lot of different learning pieces, learning tools for it to help you with this. That's why I teach two hours once a week. You'll find classes online that you can go and do the whole course in five or six days. 
I don't know about you, but my brain shuts off after a day and a half. And by the end of day two, I even stopped taking notes. And so I don't learn. That last three or four days is wasted. Wasted. By doing two hours a week, you learn it, you practice it, you review it, you come back to class with questions, and we build on that foundation, and there's no frustration. None whatsoever. Think about the expense of a face-to-face class as well. If you have to be gone for five or six days, you're not in your office working, how much is that costing you? You've got transportation, depending on where it is, that could be anywhere from a couple hundred to a thousand dollars. You've got hotel and accommodation, which is probably going to be at least another four or five hundred dollars, if not more. You've got meals and you've probably got ground transportation when you're there and you still have tuition to pay. Right. It's expensive to go and take classes, but you can do them online thanks to the Internet and we can do it virtually. So you've actually got a live teacher with you. So powerful. So powerful. And last but not least, get this to click through. Whoops, there we go. It's less expensive to study with a teacher who who charges in Canadian dollars, right? The Canadians are happy they're not having to pay American dollars, believe me. And Americans are grateful they get a 25 or 30% discount. So that's very cool too. Just want to throw in a word for IPA. Why, whoops, why would you want to consider Uh, IPA certification. This is an important point, and it looks like this, and we're almost done. It gives you the opportunity to be affiliated with other people internationally who are like-minded, who are holistic health practitioners, who have the same foundation of iridology training that you do. It gives you an opportunity to keep up to date on the latest research. This last February, one of the IPA an IPA member who's a naturopath in California, I believe, has been doing some really cool research. And he shared with us something that he's correlating, which is a way to potentially, he's finding a strong correlation, detect MTHFR in the eyes, which is way cool. By affiliating with IPA, you add your energy to the movement to get IPA, to get iridology recognized. And it lets your clients know that you have the most up-to-date education there is in the field. So the benefits here, no more unpaid homework time for you. Uh Uh-uh. You can decide what you're doing with that extra time because you're doing all your work in your client sessions. You will be able to create therapeutic sequences that will help your clients be more successful and keep them coming back to continue their wellness journey with you. Again, it's less expensive to keep a client happy than it is to keep finding new clients. And if your clients are two hit wonders, you're spending a lot of time and a lot of money looking for new clients. Number three, you'll be able to get rid of that intake questionnaire. Think of the paper you'll save. If nothing else, if nothing else, right? You'll be able to develop rapport within minutes. That's very cool. And you will be more precise in your client work. You know, that rapport is so important. Sometimes clients do disappear for years at a time. But it's not uncommon for me to get a phone call saying, hi, I'd like to book an appointment. And I get their name. And it's like, your name sounds so familiar. And they'll say, yeah, it's been about 10 years. But you helped me so much when I was there last time that I knew you could help me again. Right? Apparently, I helped them so well that after I'd seen them six or eight or 10 times, they were good to go. I'm happy with that because they remembered me later and they came back, right? That's very cool, right? So the process again is I start with asking the client what they would like my help with. I assess their eye rides. I ask questions based on what I see in their eyes. And we create a short list of recommendations. And from that list, we create the few recommendations that we want to give them. All right, five minute assessment, five minutes. Someone got a stopwatch? All right, gonna do this assessment in five minutes. This is a 58 year old female. She's in good health. She has a genetic disorder called Gilbert syndrome, which is a recognized liver insufficiency where she does not conjugate her bilirubin properly. So what that means is that if she is gets tired, if she's fasting, as in no food, 
or if she doesn't get enough sunshine, she gets jaundiced. And she's very active. But why she came in to see me after many years of being away was this. She'd gone to her doctor and had just routine blood work done. She likes to go in about every three or four years just to make sure her numbers are good. And she was a little miffed this time because everything was good except her thyroid. Her thyroid, which had always been textbook perfect, was now edging towards being hypothyroid. Huh. All right. So she wanted my help with that. She has basically blue eyes. Now on your screen, they might look steel gray. That's a category of blue. There's a lot of other colors in here, but the underlying color is blue. She has a lot of orange in her eyes. That tells us she's a little prone to some pancreatic issues, which means she probably craves sweets. And yeah, huh? she does. She is learning how to eat higher protein. She's really working on that. And she's learning how to cook with things like xylitol and stevia so that she feels emotionally satisfied by the sweetness and doesn't need to go after the sugars anymore. So that's a good thing. She has brown spots, some rusty brown and some dark brown spots. These talk about liver, liver health. Now, the spots can be acquired or they can be genetic. So we have to wonder, is this telling us about the Gilbert syndrome? Because she knows that a lot of these spots have been there her whole life as long as she can remember. She has a little bit of comb teeth, which tells us her stomach has some bits of insufficiencies. So we need to be working with getting her to chew her food a lot better. And that, that is actually something she's been very aware of for quite a while. She also has a central heterochromia, so a different color around the pupil which again suggests a little bit of a predisposition to a weaker stomach. So sometimes we'll get her to sequence her food. She's eating very simply now. She really likes to do lots of veg, lots of the low carb veg and lots of protein. And those combine well together so she doesn't have to worry about separating her starches from her proteins anymore. She has this massive fiber here. I call it an errant fiber. That's not a technical term, actually. But it suggests that there's a really strong risk of arthritis. When she was about 40, she said she woke up one morning and her hands were as stiff as a board. And it hurt to move them and she had to soak them in hot water for about 10 minutes to get them mobile again. And that went on for a few weeks. And then she thought, I'm too young to be this old. So she did a radical dietary change. She actually did a candida cleanse for six weeks because it's low acid forming and it's super clean. And at the end of six weeks, her hands were perfect. And she's been very careful with her foods ever since. And again, has moved into more of a protein and low carbohydrate vegetable uh, format lately. We also have, she also has these fibers up here, which teach about having an increased risk of osteoporosis. So we work with her to ensure that she does weight bearing and that she watches her acid levels in her body. She has vessels that are attached to the outer perimeter of her iris. This suggests an increased risk of allergies and or migraine headaches, depending on where they're at. And depending on exactly where they're at will tell us whether she's more prone to food allergies or environmental allergies. All right. And so there we go. So with that, that was a less than five minute assessment. Tons of information to work with. I would never cover that much with a new client on the first appointment, never. So again, I'm going to invite you to hop on over to, uh, to confidentnutritionist.com, get it right, send you to the right place, to get registered for the class because the registration does close at nine o'clock tonight. And we want to make sure that you get in. Again, you can do the full meal deal. You can do a four pay. You can do curriculum only. And you can do a four pay on that. So as we're getting ready to wrap up, just want to check in with you to find out, was that good? Was that good? Did you get your money's worth tonight? If you did, let's have you raise your hand. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Anyone have any questions about what we covered or about the upcoming course? And if you do, I'll have you, I've just put your hands down. So if you've got a question that you are typing in, just go ahead and raise your hand so I know to wait for you. Okay.
Well, I sure hope to see you in class. And again, we get started on Thursday, so quick start here. Look forward to seeing you again in the future, hopefully Thursday. Take good care and have a good evening. Good night.